Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the CEO of, of Ion Software. Um, I've been in the film industry for 35 years, started out doing opticals and animation work uh, and moved over to computer graphics. Um, in doing so, we invented all our own technology, which is where we've come up with Fusion um, and all our products. Um, so essentially at ION, we, we develop applications for VFX and post-production communities. Um, with Fusion, uh, we've been on, used on thousands of feature films and projects since 1988. Uh, Fusion artists around the world have used, used this to create such films as Avatar and Independence Day and Iron Man and, and Hunger Games and Alice in Wonderland and um, the X-Men series, recent ones like uh, White House Down, uh, for example, the Da Vinci Code. Um, for 25 years, uh, we've provided facilities with advanced, fully in interconnected tool sets, which is, allows us to work completely with one pipeline. Our vision is to offer ultimate speed and flexibility. With ION's GPU accelerated architecture, with CUDA and OpenCL performance maximizations, facilities experience extreme fast turnarounds. Developers and en engineers invent advanced tool sets with uh, IONS technologies. So if we have a look at the products um, that we create, we can see that uh, Fusion, which was what we started out with, uh, has long been the composite of choice for many companies uh, working with demanding schedules and with dynamic content, with genuine understanding of, of the full complex production requirements, Fusion's development of comprehensive features, speed up effects creation and f finishing process truly make Fusion an industry powerhouse. Uh, with Dimension, we developed uh, tooling and technologies for for stereo workflow and and one of the the issues that you get obviously with with stereo is to be able to to fix many problems color problems between eyes and everything so we developed um, an optical flow based technology um, and a disparity technology to that so we have complete virtual camera systems to work between uh, the eyes and we recreate eyes we can fix polarization issues, fix a lot of stereo issues, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's generation. Um, generation is one of the other issues that studios mainly have, which is how do you create a front end to an asset management system, but what you really need is an artist friendly front end. It's not a web page. A web page can't play back 4K stereo. You, in web pages, you end up with looking at, at data and naming conventions, but what you need is to hide that away from the artist, and you need to work on the shots and all the images. So it has to be very image-based. But all the metadata tracking and everything that happens with inside uh, generation is, is all under the hood, but it allows large collaborative uh, workflows to work across the studio so everybody can share in, in that uh, experience and move the projects f through very, very quickly. So this brings us to what we're going to be talking mainly about here, which is high frame rate cinematography and creating high frame rate uh, projects. So um, for the past year and or so, we've been actually working with uh, Doug Trumbull on doing a high frame rate film. And this film is at 120 frames a second. It's 4K and it's stereo. But it's much more than just that. It's all about creating a new process for the actual cinema distribution as well. Now, one of the main problems you get in, in a film um, is that you never get enough light onto the screen from the projectors. In a standard cinema, you get six-foot lambits of light and what we're getting is 60 to 80. So the whole image becomes much more real because you have a much better contrast ratio between dark to light. And so highlights actually, you wince from the highlights because they, they're so bright. 
um, and the reality of both high frame rate stereo and the large amount of light makes this process uh, very unique uh, and it's been uh, an amazing experience actually working with such a legend as Doug on all this. So, um, so what we did was, and this has always been in Fusion, is we've been resolution independent. We're also frame rate independent. So when we first met up with Doug, he needed a system to do 120 frames playback using two projectors, and they all had to be in sync. And, of course, yes, we can do that because we already had the product to do that. We've been doing it for a while because we had stereo at 120 frames a second in our own facility. So we plugged it into the projectors, and lo and behold, everything worked. And it was the first time that Doug had actually seen that. Um, it was different from ShowScan, which was a mono at 60, but this had to be all stereo. So... From that point on, we got on really well, and we've been now actually, I'm actually the co-producer of the film, um, and like I said, it's been a great experience. So if we look at what this means to the industry as a whole means, like most studios will go, oh my God, I'm now going to have five times the amount of frames that I need to work with, and they're going to be at 4K. Um, and what, what does that actually mean? What... Is that all going to be problem or actually some things solved? So if we actually have a look um, at that, some of those processes and how we solve that. For, for us, so much of this is how much can we actually push to the GPU to do? Because without um, hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of cores, you won't be able to process this quickly enough. So you want to be able to push this to the GPU go from the GPU directly into the projector. And so for since 2005, when we started down our, our GPU path, we've been pushing what we can do with the GPU. And it's not just about uh, 3D rendering or just OpenGL previewing. It's about final quality floating point images to the screen. And that, that's what we've been developing with. Um, the thing about... GPUs, and this is the great thing about NVIDIA, it w is that they want to push that technology along. So they've announced the K6000 and you, and you end up with um, 2,800 cores and 12 gigs of RAM. So that that's a really good thing. Um, but that makes your processing footprint so much smaller because you can now do that in one workstation instead of a large render farm. And that's, a, that's an important step with all this. We use a number of uh, NVIDIA technologies to do this. Uh, it's, it's not just the card. We, we've used uh, 3D vision technology f for doing all our stereo reviews um, because it all syncs at, at the high frame rate. All of this stuff is 120 frames a second capable uh, and everything. Um, as I was saying, the, the OpenGL that we do, the full... CG renderer that, that we've, we've built to, to do all this in, in real time. So we built a full CG renderer. It's completely HDRI. It's, um, it's all built using CG language. Um, we also do CUDA and OpenCL processing of 2D tools so that we can do things like volumetric rendering. Uh, for example, we built a renderer in, as, as a volumetric renderer. Um, and now we can do high frame rate playback. Um, so films now have been at 24 frames a second since the 20s, since they started moving to, to talkies. And, and the cinemas are quite capable of these days with projectors to move at 120 frames a second because that's how they flip-flop between the eyes. But as they flip-flop, they show three frames of each eye. So they flip-flop backwards and forwards between 24 frames a second. And in doing so, you get a stuttering in your motion because you're going from left to right, left to right, change frame, left to right, left to right, left to right, change frame. And so you're interrupting what is natural motion that actually occurs. So once you move to high frame rate, the you're actually doing it in the cadence 
of the eye. So you end up going, my left eye is first, but my right eye is cadenced slightly half a frame delayed because that's the natural time. So you never lose action or you never lose the, the actual um, motion between what happens. It's not discrete at, at the same time and, and then moving forward. It, it's that eye's next, that eye's that eye. And that all adds to um, uh, problems or, or challenges that you get when you do production. How do you, how do, you do 3D tracking on, uh, on, on scenes because they're now they're not, not at the same time, you know, if you've got fast motion, etc., um, or your rendering has to be staggered by, by half a frame when, when you render, etc. Um, so this also adds to uh, a lot more data coming in from the cameras, uh, means a lot more storage, uh, more rendering, more things to track. Um, and like all things, the VFX industry keeps rising to the challenge of the of, of these technological gauntlets like 3D, for example. So stereoscopic production is not twice as much work as, as, as a normal film. It's actually work squared because not only do you have to roto two frames, you have to roto and check between two frames and what, what are the problems between those, those two frames. So, so we, we've had Dimension, which we've used... Um, on, on doing a lot of uh, stereo stuff. So in, in stereo, you get color differences between left and right eyes. You get polarization problems between the mirror rigs because they don't photograph slightly. There's slight focus problems between the two cameras. Um, and these are all the time, not some of the time. They're all the time. Uh, and then you end up with twice as much rendering that you need to do, twice as much rotoscoping. Um, and you can't apply quick fixes that you could do in, in 2D. You can't just paint something because it's, you can't paint exactly the same thing in the other, the other eye, so it all has to work in stereo. So half a pixel shift in something is off the screen. So if it's not done correctly, then you know it all has to be solved differently. So, so stereo is actually quite a bit of work. Um, so, um, so as as we move to high frame rate uh, and high frame rate stereo, you're now again increasing the amount of data that you have to put through rendering. Everything goes up, and again, where we're focusing on is how do you make that an interactive experience? You you have to be you have to make the process creative. Creativity is interactivity. They, they're, they're symbiotic in their relationship. And, and, a, and it's an important thing that you, you, you want to adjust the slider and see the result. You don't want to do something and come back tomorrow and remember what you did because you're losing that, that creative process. So, um, so even in, in this um, uh, modest studio setup, we, we basically have a number of machines they're all set up with, with good-sized GPUs, and we can render all of this stuff through very quickly. We can work locally and, and actually see the results very, very quickly, and we can go straight to projector with this. So um, one of the things we developed for a number of years ago, and, and this is an example of, of, of what GPUs can do, um, if you're doing uh, volumetric clouds and fog into a 3D scene, your render times in that scene suddenly went from 20 minutes a frame to well over an hour a frame to be able to, to render that in. So on, on a film for, called Anonymous, we actually developed uh, a volumetric rendering system. So they wouldn't do it in the 3D rendering because they didn't have the time or budget to set it up. So it's all now in Fusion. So by doing that inside Fusion, you're going from, um, and it all runs on the GPU, and it's a full ray casting model, you're going from what would be an hour of frame to 10 frames a second if you're running on a Titan or KE5000 or 6000 with this sort of thing. Um, and that's one of the important things that you can actually hive off and do extremely well. 
um, in, in a compositing system. Compositing systems basically finish the images and it's an important step to put as much in the hands of, of artists as possible. So as we developed the, the uh, GPU system, uh, as I was saying, we, we did this as a full lighting model. It, it has uh, full ray casting, so things are self-shadowing as they go through, cast through, through, the, um, um, through, through the clouds and everything in, in there. So it's, it's quite significant, that performance. Um, another problem, this, this is one I'm going to focus on. Uh, pretty heavily here, uh, motion blur, and the problems are 24 frames a second. So w one of the big problems of uh, of motion at 20, 24 frames a second is you basically get approximately a 50th of a second exposure at 180 degree shutter, and that actually causes quite a bit of motion blur. And one, this is an area that. Um, high frame rate actually helps with quite dramatically. So um, if, we, if I'll just step forward now to uh, some shots and you can see the typical problems that you get and, and where um, high frame rate actually helps this. So in this case, we have um, a girl doing cartwheels and typically 24 frames a second, lots of motion blur. The problem is this gets handled to a VFX studio and they say, we want to change the background. But there is no reference for what the blue socks are because they're all completely blurred out. So, so you can't rotoscope this. You actually have to completely reconstruct the shot. And this is actually a lot of work and it's a lot of work at 24 frames a second. So if you go to 60 frames a second and 120 of a second exposure, you can see now I'm stopping the action much more. So in, typically in this case, I could actually repair that. I could actually rotoscope that out. I only have a small amount of repair, but at least I have the socks that I could actually get, you know, take out of the scene. So even though I'm rotoscoping more frames, I'm actually, I don't actually have uh, a big reconstruction problem in, in the image. And once you move to 120 frames a second, you're now got uh, the action stopped dramatically more. And so therefore, you can now do a number of things. I have five times the amount of frames. When I have five times the amount of frames, I can now optical, optically flow track this much more easily than I can at 24 frames a second. If I did uh, optical flow tracking here, what you would end up getting is where, say on the bottom left, against the plants, the optical flow will pick up the plants and not the motion of the blue legs. There is so much difference between the two frames, it actually doesn't know where they've actually come from. And so you can't really track that very, very well at all. But once you move to having five times the amount of frames, you're, you can actually track this a lot better because the frames are so close together there's such small mo motion in between the frames they become easier to track so so when we looked at what what we have to do and, and how we go about constructing this the high frame rate actually solves a lot of the issues that we get in standard 24 frames a second so even though we're processing more data we can actually solve things uh, a lot more computer-assisted because, because of these capabilities that we have now using high frame rate. And, and then we can always add that back in because, because of the optical flow, we can add in um, motion blur if we want to. So if we're moving to 24 frames a second, we can optical flow track and, and actually get the extra motion blur into that. And again, there's motion coming out of, of the cartwheel. You can see blurring in the hair. And then at a 250th of a second, 120 frames a second, the action is stopped so much more. I can actually extract that detail. I can get at the hair detail. And, and it becomes um, one of those things that, uh, that really works extremely well in, 
in doing these types of processes. So um, I'm going to finish off now, but I'll go back to... Uh, oh, oh, sorry. I'll go back to an image, So, but if does anybody have any questions I want to ask about what we're up to? Um, so the film that we've been co-producing with, with Doug is... Is, like I said, for me, it's been a very interesting experience. I have uh, a history in opticals and, and film way before uh, computer graphics was around. And, uh, and so actually working with a legend like, like Doug has been a, a great experience. Um, in this film, uh, there is no 3D applications used at all. There are only fusion and everything's managed inside generation. Uh, all the playback straight to the projectors at 4K, 120 frames a second is done by generation. Um, all the project management is through that, uh, all the stereo alignment, all the stereo scenes, uh, the 3D is all done inside Fusion. Um, in d saying that, um, we it was a great uh, experience because a lot of the elements here are not simulated. We've gone and used... Um, cloud tanks, uh, motion control, um, l different types of lighting elements, and, and it's been, been great to go back and, and do things that here in SIGGRAPH you see people spending months and months trying to do a simulation, and when you see it back in a cloud tank and you, see, you know, start dropping dyes in and, and ferro fluids and things like that, you, you get to see things in real time that you... You, you know, just happen, right? And, and it looks amazing when, when you do it. So you kind of have this great creative process. And, and, and it's, uh, it's certainly been refreshing for me to do this again. It's, um, you know, it's been a great experience to kind of go back and go, wow, you just can't do that in computer graphics. Or, you, you, or to, for computer graphics guys to do that, you need that reference that's like, here's what you're going to recreate rather than, you know, let's, let's see what happens when we do this. And, and, and that's... That's been a, a, a amazing, um, amazing experience. So, um, questions? Anything? Very cool. That was a very interesting uh, comment that you made at the end. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we have any questions off of that or anything else to ask Steve directly. Yeah. What cameras are you using? Um, we were using uh, Canon C500s for this. Um, and they go to uh, we use codex recorders basically, so it was all it's all done in Canon RMF RAWs. We they they output basically uh, they've got about 14 stops of dynamic range, um, and come out as a 10 bit uh, RAW file basically. We do have a question from the virtual theater. Um, the question is, do you think we're at or near a tipping point where our expectations about traditional production techniques are going to go through a radical shift? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think the shift has already been happening. I think one of the things that, that kind of happens in this industry that I've seen more and more as we go along, there is more, um, there's more emphasis put on to... Uh, making things too complex and so everything gets forced to be CG and people have forgotten that um, you don't have to shoot a green screen out a window you could put a backdrop in and then you're not having to do post-production on those things you know it, it does become you know people should remember that you know in camera was used for many many years um, and can still solve things and make things a lot a lot simpler so um, I, I, I think you know, I, you know I, I think it's one of those things that, that it's awesome what, what computer graphics doing. Um, but, but on the other hand, you, you know, you don't want to over-solve the problem. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the things that's kind of coming, you know, so. Any other questions for Steve? Okay. Well, then, thank you, Steve, again. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I assume uh, at some stage, uh, by September, we'll be able to uh, show this film and people in the Los Angeles region will be able to see it 
um, because it is a new process, it's a completely different screen and projector, and it can't go into a normal theatre. So there will be special screenings um, set up in Los Angeles in, in, in the September time frame so people will be able to see this. So That's fantastic. We'll maybe, let you know. Maybe.